Welcome everyone to this edition of AJOT Authors and Issues. Uh, here on Authors and Issues, we like to talk to researchers about their research and other things to help bridge the gap between uh, research and practice. My name is Stacey Reynolds. I am the Editor-in-Chief of AJOT. And co-hosting with me today is Sabrina Hinckley, who is the OTD, who is an OTD student at Virginia Commonwealth University and is serving as an AJOT student representative. Our guests today are Dr. Kelly Tanner and Sarah O'Rourke at Nationwide Children's Hospital and Valerie Duffin from Intermountain Health. They are the authors of an article just published in AJOT entitled Implementing Parent Coaching in Hospital-Based Pediatric Occupational Therapy, a Multi-Site Quality Improvement Project. Whew, that's a lot. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And to start us off, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're zooming in from, and how did you all start working together? So I'll start. I'm Kelly Tanner. As you said previously, I'm a research scientist at Nationwide Children's Hospital, which is located in Columbus, Ohio, and I get to work closely with Sarah. So I'll pass it off to you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sarah O'Rourke and I am the outpatient OT program manager here at Nationwide Children's Hospital. So oversee the provision of our outpatient developmental services at our main hospital, along with all of our close to homes across the city. So Val, I think you're up. My name is Valerie Duffin. I am an occupational therapist and outpatient rehab manager at Primary Children's Hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I oversee our outpatient clinics. Um, we have six clinics. I only oversee two of them. So that's thankfully, um, <laughs> that's me. Nice. Yeah. And we all started working together because we had this multi-site project that was funded by the American Occupational Therapy Foundation as one of the implementation grants. Um, and all of our sites are um, sites where we see kids who were referred from the CP Early Detection and Implementation Network, which is funded by the CP Foundation. So that's kind of how we got connected and started working together. We had one more um, clinical site for this project that isn't implemented today or that isn't represented today, which is Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And our colleague, Kristen Cunningham, was our lead for that site. And we'd also be remiss if we didn't mention our additional co-author, Natalie Maitre, who provided a lot of mentorship for this project. Great. Yeah, that's exciting to think how these grants kind of pulled everybody together. And I know we'll get into it more, but it sounds like there was it was really a collaborative effort that mm -hmm. that was required for this project. Um, so the article um, that, again, is published in AJOT, it describes a quality improvement project that is aimed at increasing implementation of parent coaching by occupational therapists in pediatric outpatient settings. And to clarify, these were parents of children who either had or, or their children were at risk for cerebral palsy, and these were young kids under the age of two, right? Um, so there are two key pieces, I think, the, that I want our listeners to understand before we dive too deep into it. Um, first, what is parent coaching? How, how did you all define that or, or conceptualize that for this study? Um, and why was parent coaching the approach that you decided to implement? Yeah, so um, parent coaching is an approach to providing occupational therapy services that has been used a lot in our birth to three early intervention programs with a lot of success, um, as shown in the AOT practice guidelines for children zero to five. Uh, but parent coaching hasn't been implemented as much in hospital based pediatrics, which is why we focused on it for this project. And we use the model developed by Rush and Sheldon, which includes five components of parent coaching, action, observation, feedback, reflection, and joint planning. Yes, um, we really wanted to see our practitioners spend as much time as possible helping parents learn to interact with their babies and handle their babies more. Um, to really prevent the or prevent promote sorry motor development, um, rather than just having our therapists handle the babies themselves the whole session, um, something that we learned at Primary Children's was that we have spent a lot of time 
telling parents that we have been using this model. Um, when we initially do our evaluations, that was something we always said was that we uh, provided a parent coaching model, but our therapist found that they spent a lot of time talking to parents about it and not actually having the parents do the handling piece. Um, so that was a, a really fun thing that we learned. Um, it's also really important in parent coaching to make sure we're helping parents learn how to work with their kids within their home environment, and which is tricky in outpatient because we're not in the home environment. Um, and so that's where our joint planning component really comes in. And that's what it's all about. I guess the second question, the second piece, if I can just follow up on that, is that this was a quality improvement study. So how does quality improvement differ from like a traditional clinical trials research or an effectiveness study? Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. So quality improvement or QI research really aims to improve the care that we're providing to our patients and improve systems and processes that we're following. Um, And I think the biggest difference between QI and traditional effectiveness research is that we're really selecting strategies that have already been tested in the research. So, for example, Sarah mentioned the AOTA practice guidelines for children birth to five, and that's really where we went to look for which strategy we would try to implement um, and found that there was support for using that approach in young children with motor delays, including those with CP. Um, And that kind of differs with uh, traditional effectiveness research, where we might be really focused on looking at patient outcomes. For quality improvement, uh, we might include patient outcomes, but for this study, we were really more interested in practitioner behaviors and whether we could um, see practitioners really implementing those five components that Sarah mentioned. Thanks for that. I think that's a really important distinction and explains, I think, going into thinking about what your outcomes were and what you looked at, really why that's what the focus was. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, Hi, everyone. In (laughs) your research, you applied the parent coaching intervention, which you called a plan, do, study, act, or you also kind of abbreviated as PDSA, um, across your three different sites. However, you also noted the significant differences between these sites, between the number of patients, you know, the types of diagnoses, sort of the at risk or, you know, already diagnosed. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us how you were able to tailor the interventions and kind of carry them out effectively between these three sites since since they were so spread out, it sounds. Yeah, I um, can start first from NCH and then maybe Val, you can share a little bit about what your team was up to. Um, We did use these plan, do, study, act cycles. So within quality improvement, those are our mini cycles of change. So we try something, we see how it goes, we get feedback, and then we decide kind of what our next um, cycle is, integrating all of that feedback. And what we really tried to do here at Nationwide was use the resources that we already had at our hospital. Um, So, for example, we had an existing group already within the department that was interested in providing recommendations for treating children under two with CP. So we were really able to leverage that group and those interventions and existing platforms to roll out some of our new education regarding this project. Uh, We did a lot of the same things at Primary Children's. Um, We... Uh, some differences where we have uh, some monthly education meetings for our occupational therapists and we were able to implement training there. Um, We use Microsoft Teams quite a bit and we were able to create a parent coaching team um, and provide lots of uh, resources and uh, updates through using Microsoft Teams. Um, And then we have some uh, care process models that we have created and are implementing it across our sites. And we have been able to include the parent coaching method into uh, those care process models. 
And then I'll chime in a little bit about our third site, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, they similarly had a lot of programs and structures that we were able to piggyback off of to implement our Plan Do Study Act cycles. Um, but something I think we would be remiss in not mentioning is that this project started in July of 2020. So most of what we did throughout this project was virtual. Um, and the original plan was that I was gonna travel to Salt Lake and to Philadelphia to really get to know the teams there, understand their processes, um, understand how they worked and meet people in person, but we were never able to do that. So we, to this date, we've really only <laughs> met in person at the Inspire Conference, um, which we've been able, to, been able to get together at the last couple of years. But we had to be really intentional about using some of our QI tools, like process mapping and SWOT analyses of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to really get some of that information um, through virtual means rather than just being able to see it. So really having people walk through exactly what happens when you see a patient pop up on your schedule. Do you open their chart first or do you go out to the lobby and see them? Um, do you talk to the parent in the lobby or do you bring them back to the room? How often do you bring them back to the room? Um, and there's little differences between between all three of our sites. And then given that all of our sites are also multi-site, so we have eight close to home centers in Columbus. Um, Valerie, I think you had said you had six different sites. So um, it what that was one of the challenges was just understanding how all these different sites operate and then figuring out how to work with those individual teams. That's crazy and being able to have to do that like all through virtual. Yeah. That's Communication, definitely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so then you also noted that none of the occupational therapy practitioners um, really had participated in a formal quality improvement study. You mentioned that, you know, it sounds like they were kind of all on board, but did you have to do anything to get any buy-in from them to do this, considering it was 2020 and considering everything else that was going on? Yeah, so we're all very fortunate to come from institutions that have really strong cultures of evidence-based practice and research and a lot of support behind them. Uh, so we were, I think all three of our sites were kind of ready for something new and really saw, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this later, I think, but education alone does not produce change. Um, that's really kind of a theme of our article and of this project. And I think we had all kind of seen that in snippets across all three of our institutions. So I think we were ready to try something different. And um, in terms of sort of frontline clinician um, buy-in, I think really the education that we did and the way we did it by really trying to fit into existing meetings um, we did some education virtually when possible, or we did all of our education virtually to clarify because it was 2020. Um, but we did a lot of, some of it asynchronously so that folks could review the content and then come to a live discussion session. Um, and we were really mindful of um, just understanding the constraints that come with trying to produce change when people already have so much else on their plate. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Valerie, I would love if you could talk a little bit about Primary Children's Hospital and your fabulous peer coaches, because I think at your site in particular, that was such an important way to get buy-in from folks. Absolutely. So I had um, a good number of my practitioners who were super excited about this project, and uh, we were able to have a peer coach, so a practitioner who was really excited and wanted to take kind of a lead role in our clinics um, in this project. So each of our clinics, I believe, had a peer coach and we met monthly with Kelly to talk through any issues, concerns, questions, wins, uh, all the things. And I think that that really helped to push our sites uh, it, it, it just was, it was such a great thing, you know, as, as a manager, I felt like I could only reach so many people. Um, so it was really nice to have on site coaches and, um, leaders in this program. Yeah. It sounds like those people really served as kind of champions at each of the sites. Absolutely. Which is great. Yes. Yeah. They were great. 
I wanted to talk a little bit about measurement and an outcome. So uh, Kelly, I think you mentioned earlier, um, these weren't child focused outcomes. They were, you were really looking at change in practitioner behavior, specifically the adoption of this, uh, of documenting their coaching practice. Um, and you also included some process measures or, or knowledge of parent coaching, which was, uh, I believe, a pre-post kind of looking at um, their, their change in knowledge or, or, or change in understanding. And, um, and ba- you had balancing measures, which were things like parent satisfaction and experience. So I was wondering if you could just briefly tell us, like, why did you choose those measures? Like, what was your thought process? I, I guess you wrote a grant about this. So, like, you had to sit there and really think through, like, what are we going to measure? What are the outcomes mm-hmm. going to look like? What was that process like? And how did you land on those specific things? Yeah, I, I can start and then um, can let Kelly add to this too. So we chose our outcome measure to focus on changing practitioner behavior because that really was the focus of the implementation study. Um, as you heard, education alone isn't enough to change practice. And so we ask people to do the thing and we just assume that they do it. Uh, and we don't actually know if it's being done or if it has changed practice. And so that was really the the hope and some intentionality behind the outcome measure. Um, we did review clinical documentation to gather this measure, and we were looking for practitioners documented use of those um, five principles of parent coaching that we taught them. And then we chose the pre-post education scores for our process measure because that is the the change in the process, the change in the system that we wanted to capture in terms of um, just practitioner knowledge around parent coaching. Um, And these these terms of process measure, outcome measure, balancing measure were definitely new to me when I started this type of work, but um, through mentorship and um, I got some structured um, education myself on how to do quality improvement through an internal workshop at our hospital on the IHI model, the Institution for Healthcare Improvement model that kind of helped me learn how to do this and come up with these measures. And Sarah has been able to go through that training as well. So mm-hmm. it's nice to have um, somebody else who knows all the terms and, and everything to use in this type of work. Uh, but Sarah was exactly right with the outcome measure and the process measures. And then that third type of measure is the balancing measures. And those are really ones that you don't want to see change as a result of your intervention. So they're kind of balancing out that scale where we want to see improvement in one area, but we don't want to see another area unintentionally get worse. So for this project, we really looked at two different things. One was caregiver satisfaction. We wanted to make sure that once we started doing parent coaching, um, our caregivers who were generally pretty satisfied across all of our three sites weren't all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, you know, we don't like this approach. The therapists don't have their hands on my babies as much, you know, this is not good. Um, And then we also looked at practitioner productivity. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't causing um, too much additional work for our practitioners and they were able to still fit this into our into their day. Um, and those those two measures were really hard for us to capture because our institutions all measure productivity and satisfaction in different ways. So as far as we are able to tell, we do not think we had any unintended consequences with caregiver satisfaction or um, therapist productivity, uh, but that was really a challenge to pull those two measures kind of across our three sites and try to come up with something that would be equivalent. Thank you. Yeah, that's really helpful. And uh, I'll say for the listeners, we can post some information about the IHI model um, below the video so that if people are interested in learning more and maybe attending a workshop like that, then they can look into that. Um, So yeah, you kind of just hit on some of the different measurements. I was kind of wondering if we could elaborate on some of that. So in your results section, you noted that the practitioner knowledge scores increased from, you said 83.1% to I think 87.9% after the initial education. But then you kind of hit on this a little bit how the parent satisfaction and experience and sometimes the practitioner productivity scores didn't change as much. Um, Were these findings surprising to you or were there any different things that were kind of shocking? 
I have to say, I was a little bit surprised that there was a change in practitioner knowledge scores. Um, I kind of thought folks might already be familiar with caregiver coaching from the pandemic. We had been doing a lot of telehealth um, starting in March of 2020, and now we were in July. When the grant started, I, we didn't start collecting data right away or doing our education right away, uh, but I wondered if people would already be pretty familiar with the concepts and um, and not maybe learn as much from our education. So that that was a surprising finding to me um, and makes me glad that we, it, I think it also shows that like, you can't just skip the education part. Although mm -hmm. education alone doesn't work, there does need to be like a basis of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think to add to that, the structure around uh, what we were actually educating about, I think really helped kind of define and put some boundaries around what are we talking about? How are we defining operationally parent coaching? And, and I would anticipate that was another piece of um, some of that knowledge jump. Um, but uh, as Kelly mentioned before, those balancing measures are things that we don't want to change. And so we were glad to see that our parent satisfaction uh, remained and that our, you know, productivities um, standards performance also uh, didn't change. Um, so at all three sites, you, kind of, you all hit on this, that um, all three sites in your study have very, you know, strong evidence-based practice and professional development. Like those are kind of the things that you guys focus on the, um, where you guys are. So mm -hmm. I was just curious whether there was large differences between the sites, considering you're kind of spread out across the country. Um, and if so, like, are there any possible explanations for how these responses differed? Yeah, I think all um, institutions measure satisfaction differently. Um, at NCH, our scores were very consistent across the whole timeline of implementation, uh, which was great, which was what we wanted um, to see. We had a nice baseline of um, parent satisfaction scores, and then through the process, that baseline kind of maintained in terms of that satisfaction. We do want our parents to be highly satisfied and, and we didn't want them to become dissatisfied as we were taking a really strong look at parent coaching. Ours it, at Primary Children's are were very similar. We didn't see a lot of change. Um, ours are a little tricky as well in that they are measured uh, multidisciplinary. So, yeah. It was difficult to look at it and see whether this occupational therapy project made a difference, um, but they did remain pretty consistent. And one thing that we noted throughout was that we had a lot of just subjective, positive parent feedback um, and also practitioner feedback. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, I think what is really interesting about this, and maybe it's not the intention of the article maybe, but are just like the natural challenges and things that come with A, a multi-site study and B, an implementation study, right? Because you're trying to implement something in the real world where there aren't these strict controls and not everybody does things the same way. And, mm -hmm. and it really is, it is a unique approach. It's a unique way to do research that has its own inherent challenges. And, and I think other people are going to benefit from hearing, you know, what you guys did, what you came up against, but also how you dealt with it and managed it, which I think is really great. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to jump back to something has been mentioned a couple of times, which is the fact that even though the practitioners increased in knowledge, their behavior didn't actually change until you started implementing some other strategies. Um, and so what, I mean, what was that? And, and what does that tell you? What's the finding that we take away <laughs> in how we try to implement change in clinical settings? I think obviously, you know, you said it, education's not enough, but what's the, what's the, the takeaway message? <laughs> From all of that, what what do what do people who want to do something like this? What do they need to do if they want to see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this is something that Sarah and I talk about a lot and think about at our particular hospital um, because this is the first project that we did that was a quality improvement project. But we have done several since then and have found the same thing. 
when we do education, um, a lot of times we, we have a lot of groups that are coming up with clinical recommendations for us to implement. And in the past, we would do a, a big educational session and tell everybody either through a, a learning module or a live uh, presentation to make a practice change. And once we started measuring that, we saw that it really isn't, um, it doesn't get you all the way there. So we see like 30 to 50% uptake, I would say, when we just ask people to make a change. But in order to get to that 80 or 90% that we want to see, we have to do other strategies. And the I think the best way that we found to do this is really to measure it. Um, if we, anytime we ask somebody to make a practice change, um, for example, we want them to use a new assessment or write their goals in a new way, we really need to have that follow-up piece of some kind of measurement of, um, and which is typically for us chart reviews. And when we can, we automate it and use data reports, but sometimes they are hand chart reviews of really um, seeing if folks were able to make that change and then um, adding in additional strategies. So one of the big strategies we used for this study was audit and feedback. So when we did our chart reviews, we would then um, give positive public positive feedback to those who were doing a great job and private corrective feedback to those who maybe needed to make a tweak. Um, so that's just one example of um, an intervention that we found really helpful is to really call out those wins publicly and then provide individualized um, feedback to folks who might need to make a change. I don't know, Sarah, if you want to add anything too. Yeah, yeah. I, I We really have to think about how we are supporting practitioners to make these changes anytime we want to see an improvement in practice and get creative with how we can help um, practitioners actually make those changes. And I think that's what's so unique and helpful about a quality improvement framework and tool is that it gives you that structure uh, and pathway to do that, but it's able to be so individualized and contextualized to the space in which you're actually working that you can drill in and see what are the barriers here to this change. And then what is my path to reduce the barrier or make a change or a new process to, um, you know, remove as many barriers from our frontline clinicians to actually implementing best care. That's fantastic. And I don't know, it, it, it had me thinking about teaching because sometimes, you know, you ask students to do the reading and they don't do it unless you tell them there's going to be a quiz on it. You know, there's, there has to be some accountability or some, some metric, some measure. Um, but I, I do really like how you guys were able to individualize it and really look at what are the needs across the different sites and, and, and maybe even across the different clinics within each site, because you guys had a lot going on. Sabrina, I'm going to have you go ahead and jump in with your last or next question. Um, so as a current OT student, and we've learned in lectures about clinical research design and evidence-based practice. Um, and you kind of mentioned about implementing, you know, your, I guess, a different types of education and stuff like that. So when it goes to like implementation and translation from research to actual practice, um, are these skills that you think should be learned during like a degree program or is this more something that they'll learn, that like OT practitioners will learn once they're in the field? I think that's a great question, Sabrina. And I know that a lot of programs are um, including more implementation science and possibly even quality improvement into their curricula. Um, I did not have any formal implementation science or um, dissemination science in my graduate program. I don't think um, Sarah or Valerie did either from our discussions. Uh, so for us, it was really more post-professional learning. And I think being in the field for um, as long as the three of us have been in the field, you know, we've seen, as I talked earlier about how um, we were seeing that that change wasn't happening. We needed some different tools to add to our toolbox. Um, so I, I hope that students who are in programs now are able to get some of this content and start early on learning these skills. But I think once you get out into practice and you see that change can be really hard, um, doing post-professional learning is also extremely helpful. 
Um, so then kind of in general, I guess, between the two different, I guess, options of implementing this, what are some benefits and challenges do you think of this? I can jump in on that. Um, so at Primary Children's, this has been a really big thing in the last couple of years. Um, we call it continuous improvement instead of quality improvement. So if I say continuous, I apologize. <laughs> um, and, uh, Intermountain Health has actually come up with a, they call it the continuous improvement uh, certification experience. So all of our uh, leadership takes this and gets a certification. And it's also open to any practitioner, um, any other employee who wants to take it, which is really great. Um, so this is something that we have been really pulling into um, in the last couple of years. And as far as benefits go, I can say that we have seen a huge uptick in being willing to think outside the box and listen to ideas of practitioners and uh, try new things and be able to look at it and say, okay, well, this didn't work. What can we try differently to make it better? Um, or this worked great, awesome. Let's implement this into our processes. Um, so it's really pulled our staff in to feel like they have more of a say in uh, their workload, which has been a really, really positive um, thing for our culture and um, for our staff satisfaction. Um, and then as far as challenges go, it's always challenging, I think, to implement something new. Um, and I think a lot of our uh, staff at times, when we say we're going to try a new project, um, sometimes we've gotten the eye rolls or, <laughs> oh, no, here we go again. Um, but ultimately, it's ended up to be a really, really positive thing. So it's always hard to implement new changes and come up with new processes because it's a culture change and change mm -hmm. is something that is can be really difficult. I wanted to jump in really quickly because I know Valerie had mentioned her institution specific education and I mentioned the one that Sarah and I did as well. Um, but the AOTA website has some additional resources available there on the quality page. There's information there about just quality in general and kind of where to look for, for good information. Um, and then there's a knowledge translation toolkit available on the AOTA website as well that has some specific tools and resources for implementing changes. So just wanted to throw those out there too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And we can post those, those links as well. Um, as we finish up the discussion, are there future plans? I think you already said that you've been doing more QI projects since this article has been published. Um, mm -hmm. what, what else do you have in, pro in progress and what are the next steps for the, the coaching study or is that just done? Yes, so the coaching study is definitely wrapped up and we've enjoyed kind of seeing each other at conference every year and trading resources that don't have any specific plans for our three sites at this time. Um, and you're correct, we at Nationwide Children's Hospital have a few other quality improvement projects in the works. Um, one of them is about um, implementing participation level goals. So kind of looking at the World Health Organization's ICF framework, thinking about how we can target that participation area for our outpatient goals. And we're actually presenting that at conference this year. So we're excited to kind of um, move that forward. Um, and then Valerie, do you have any other projects that you wanna talk about for your hospital? Um, yeah, we have a couple exciting things that we've been working on uh, within our occupational therapy department. Um, one is we've been working on a perinatal mental health project. So, uh, and we were, just able this year to roll it out to all of rehab, which is really exciting. Um, so we are um, providing some screeners to uh, caregivers of children under 12 months old to look at uh, the perinatal mental health and look for concerns um, and then providing resources and uh, as needed. 
because we're seeing a huge impact in patient outcomes when parents have the resources that they need for their mental health. Um, and we are doing the late call for papers for this one. So I'm hoping that we might get into AOTA next year. Mm -hmm. um, and then another thing that we're working on is uh, we have rolled out a new process for our feeding training, uh, which has been really exciting as well. And also putting in for that one for AOTA. So, you know, keep fingers crossed that we'll be able to present. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I really appreciate that, um, you know, I think that there is this sense that research gets done by people in the ivory tower and, and it's not real and it doesn't. And I love how, I mean, solid this work is, but also how practical and it just shows that this, this is done in real world settings and mm -hmm. hopefully inspires more people to, to want to take on some of these projects. And certainly AJOT is supportive of that. We love to see that. So, well, I, I love this discussion. It's been very stimulating, but now it is the time in our, in our session to play a stupid party game. And given that we are um, in the fall season, uh, we wanted to get to know more about you guys and your thoughts on the season of fall and, and, and the, the, the celebration of Halloween in particular. So we just, uh, th these aren't right or wrong questions. We're just going to um, get your opinion on things. And I'll start with the first one, which is, what is the appropriate thing to do with a pumpkin? Do you carve it? Do you paint it? Do you eat it? Uh, or nothing, pumpkins are useless and you don't even bother with them. What are your thoughts on pumpkins, Kelly? You know, I... Before I had children, I would say carve away, um, but sometimes it's hard to kind of fit that activity in, I feel like, with young kids. So we've had great success with um, painting and stickers the past few years. I am hoping to trial a new to me technique of pounding cookie cutters into the pumpkin this year. Mm. So I'll have to report back. I, has anybody tried that yet? Mm -mm. No? Okay. Um, that I'm going to try that out and see how that goes. I feel like that'd be a little bit easier than getting the big knife out and carving. Giving big we'll knives see. to small children. Yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, what about you? Any strong opinions? Oh, on Oh, yeah. You know, we have done both painting and carving. So when the kids were little, we did a lot more painting. Um, I didn't love the painting because when it rains, now the paint is all over the porch. Um, and that was a little hard for my, um, I have a dislike of visual clutter and there was color in places it was not supposed to be. And so I didn't love that. Uh, but we have moved towards uh, the carving. The kids really love it. I, I do have one uh, in particular who is a little sensory sensitive. So I am all about getting his hands in there and pulling the the gunk out and uh, having a nice sensory experience while we're making our pumpkins. Valerie, any strong opinions on pumpkins? You know, I, I have to agree with Kelly. Um, just taking the time to carve the pumpkins was just so fun. Um, <laughs> I have to say now uh, my kids have gotten older. My oldest is 16. So it's really great now for me to be able to say, okay, you're in charge, help everybody else. <laughs> yeah, whole family mm -hmm. affair then. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Next question. Another opinion-based question. What is your stance on pet costumes? Mm -hmm. Is it that pet costumes are ridiculous and a waste of money or you should absolutely dress your pets in costumes or that pets should get to choose for themselves mm. if they want to wear a costume or not. Mm. Sarah, where do you stand on this one? Oh, gosh. I think they are the most ridiculous thing I have ever seen. <laughs> However, I tried to put our um, golden lab in a uh, an Ohio State uh, Buckeye sweater once. And it totally paralyzed her. She refused to move. Um, so not not on the the animal costume train. sounds like she chose not she to did choose. well that's true <laughs> she she did she did choose and she did not uh like it <laughs> valerie pet costumes yes or no okay well um i'm kind of embarrassed to say that uh before i had children i may or may not have dressed dressed my horse 
dresses up in costumes for Halloween. Um, yeah. And then I had kids and, you know, there was nothing for a while. But this year um, I have a wonderful giant golden doodle who um, we just got certified as a therapy team um, earlier this year. So our the clinics that I work in are doing a Barbie theme for Halloween. So I'm trying to figure out how he and I are going to dress up together mm. in a Barbie theme. So mm. I guess I'm on the yes train. <laughs> okay. I'm just picturing a, a golden doodle, Ken. It just sounds mm -hmm. perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Kelly, thoughts on pets? You know, dress or no dress? We do not have any pets, so I feel like the pet owners of the world should just embrace it probably and, and go for the costumes. We did get, um, we have a skeleton in our yard, and just yesterday I purchased him a skeleton dog, so I'll have to keep my eye out for um, for a costume for our, our newly acquired skeleton <laughs> dog. Maybe that's a good start for us. Very nice. Yeah, we have a dachshund and we've always called him like the fun police because anytime people are laughing or having fun in the house, he barks like he wants it to stop. Mm -hmm. And so this year for the first time we got him um, a police officer costume. So he's mm -hmm. going to be Officer Randy of the fun police um, nice. going out. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> okay, two, two other quick questions. Number one, what candy do you buy hoping that you'll get leftovers, or since you, I think all said you had kids, uh, what candy do you steal from your kids? Any? There's always a uh, chocolate tax at our house. So usually get first dibs of that bucket and pull out one or two of the things that uh, I like, but we usually bag like to buy the big bags of chocolate and hope we don't hand them, hand them all out. Nice. Mm -hmm. Same. It's the almond joys for me. Mm. I am also a big chocolate fan. I love Twix and Milky Way. So those are typically the ones I go for. Mm -hmm. Oh, Kelly, I'm sending you all our Milky Ways. Yeah. No, I'll take it. the almond joys. Yeah. yeah. Especially <laughs> the Milky Way Midnights. Those are the best. Mm, the dark chocolate ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Last one for you all. What is your favorite fall or Halloween tradition? Is mm. there one that comes mm. to mind? Uh, I think recently for us, we live in a um, a place where we don't have a neighborhood. So the past seven years we've um, had kids, it's always been a tradition that we go to a friend's house, do chili and do um, kind of trick or treat in a group. Uh, and that's been a fun tradition, I think, that we look forward to every year. And I'm the opposite. I live in a neighborhood and we have um, our street has done like an early trick or treat kickoff because we found that we weren't actually able to like talk to the neighbors. So we start trick or treat an hour early on our street and go into the night, which is fun. Yeah. Nice. So we have a local uh, farm. I'm going to go away from trick or treat. Um, that is really fun. They have a giant pumpkin patch, um, lots of fun things for the kids to do. Um, and they have this little um, shed where they make, uh, fresh apple cider donuts that are the most amazing things ever. Um, so we love to go visit the ranch. That's great. All right. Well, thank you for letting us learn a little bit more about you and your fall activities. Um, mm -hmm. As we wrap up, is there anything else you would like the listeners to know about your research or you in general or any other resources? And I, I made a note, Kelly, you had mentioned uh, the Knowledge Translation Toolkit and the AOTA quality links, so I can link those. Anything else that you think would be useful for listeners? Uh, I, I can't readily think of another resource other than just um, encouragement. It's incredibly tangible and a uh, uh, kind of universally applicable tool into implementation or uh, change that you would like to see. Great. Mm -hmm. I think I gave my best resources already and that's all I got. Mm -hmm. I don't have any resources per se, um, but just advocate for jumping in and trying out this kind of process. Um, it was so fun to meet 
Kelly and Sarah and Kristen and be able to work, you know, I mean, with different hospitals across the country. Mm -hmm. um, I can say when I started this, that that was not something that I ever would have thought that I was interested in or would be doing. Um, so I would just advocate for jumping out of your comfort zone and trying new things because great things can come of it. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for being with us today. We appreciate your time and your insight. And I do want to remind listeners that um, this article will be available open access on the AJOT website. So um, definitely read the whole thing. We touched on some highlights today, but it's a great paper and um, and we will make sure to, um, if you have questions, uh, post them under the video and we'll make sure that we get back to you on those. So thank you all so much and good luck with all your presentations at AOTA coming up and mm -hmm. we'll hopefully continue to publish more of your work. Bye everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.